烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，烧埃铃铃声。Namaste. So, since we talked about liberation, five kinds of liberation, we've been getting some questions from people asking, "How is it possible? Huh? How is it possible if Maya is form and Brahman is formless? Then, once somebody gets liberation." How could they continue to have form? In other words, there there are five kinds of liberation, and the most common one is sayuja. Sayuja is when you merge into the Brahman and disappear. But then there's salokya, samipya, sarupya, and sarshti. What about those kinds of liberation? How are they possible? How can you have liberation, non-duality, and still have form? Well, the answer is obscure, <laughs> very unknown by most people.、Uh, but once you understand it, it's very simple and straightforward. There are two kinds of Maya. Dualistic Maya and non-dual Maya, Maha Maya, which is illusion, ignorance, suffering, and rebirth in samsara, and then there's Yoga Maya, where one retains form and individuality but has no ego, and is on a non-dual platform of consciousness. In direct relationship with the supreme. So, this is yoga Maya.、Uh, a lot of people know about Mahamaya, but comparatively few understand yoga Maya. So let's look into it a little bit. Everybody has a relationship with God. They may be aware of it, or they may not be aware of it. Now, generally, when they're not aware of it, they're under yoga Maya. Sorry, they're under Maha Maya. They're lost. They're covered by the material energy, the illusion that I am a person, an individual, Mister So and So. And I live in this place. I'm a member of this country and this religion and this family. And I have my wife and my children and my house and my business and so on and so on. I and mine. This is a hankar. A hankar means false ego. It means an identity that is based on maha maya. The great illusion. Ma ya means what is not. Ma, the root word ma, also refers to measuring. So, how do we measure what we are? Where is the boundary of our selfhood, of our individuality? See, this is the、uh, root concept of ma ya. That we are a finite being with boundaries, an individual, in other words. So, what happens when we get liberation? Well, like I said, the easiest、uh, liberation to qualify for is to merge into the absolute, sayuja.、Huh? Sayuja Mukti is the one that is advertised and talked about as the highest liberation. Well, that's not necessarily true. 
It depends on your taste. Huh? Somebody might say, well, I like vanilla ice cream. Vanilla ice cream is the highest and best. And somebody else will say, no, I like chocolate chip. You know, <laughs> somebody else likes Rocky Road. It's up to their taste, which is the highest for them. So the same goes for liberation. For many people, Sayuja seems to be the ultimate. Well, let them think that way. <laughs> It's like, take your, take your Sayuja Mukti, bye. <laughs> we won't be seeing you again, uh, because that means the end of individuality. One merges into the absolute Brahman and is never seen again. So that is also the annihilation of individuality. And this appeals very much to the demons the Asuras, those who are against the Vedas, those who rebel against the instructions of the Vedas and ultimately against the instructions of Shiva and Shakti. Now, why are the demons so enamored of the Sayuja Mukti? Well, there are two reasons. One reason is that to be against God is very painful. Everything is a struggle against great odds. It's like me against the universe, you know, kind of a losing deal. So it's very, very difficult for the demons to continue to exist. That's why they're so nasty. They're always in a bad mood. Huh? They're always coming up with some plot to destroy the world or whatever. You know, they're so evil. Huh? They're haters. They put down others. They uh, find fault even with great saintly persons and they attack. This is the, the, the best way to know who is a demon because usually the demon will be the first one to attack. Why do they do that? Well, they want to increase their individuality. They're greedy. They want more I and more mine. Uh -huh. And when this fails, as it always does, then the only thing they can think of is annihilation. They want to annihilate themselves. That's why they commit suicide so often. Huh? People will take overdose of drugs or they'll shoot themselves or jump off a bridge or something. You know, they commit suicide. Life has become unbearable. Why? They have no relationship with the Absolute. Now, relationship with the Absolute is a very elaborate subject called Rasa Tattva. And to, to make it brief and simple, there are five principal Rasas. Neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. A great example of neutrality, the rasa of neutrality, is the Buddha. He tried to achieve complete annihilation of the self while still retaining consciousness and the ability to function in the world to help others attain the same thing. <laughs> so this is neutrality. And there are some great sages who even have a relationship with the personal forms of God who are in this same relationship, this same mood of neutrality. They appreciate the greatness of God, but they don't have a very close relationship. It's uh, adoration from afar, uh, neutral adoration. Then there are those who are probably the majority of the devotees, not the demons now, the other category, those who have a positive relationship with God. They are in the mood of servitorship. And you can read so many prayers in the scriptures in this mood. Oh Lord, you are the greatest. You are the most wonderful. I don't want anything except to serve you forever in some capacity or other. And that service capacity is one's eternal absolute 
non-dual personality. One can have eternal individuality, not eternal ego. In the psyche of the devotee, the ego is replaced by the Lord in whatever form. And so the Lord then evaluates everything and gives instructions. See, this is yoga, this joining the individual consciousness with the supreme consciousness. And it's maya because it's measuring everything and giving instructions. So this is yoga maya. And there are many, many illustrations of uh, servitorship and also friendship. Arjuna and Krishna, for example. Arjuna is a devotee in eternal friendship mood with Krishna, who is an incarnation of Vishnu. So even, even Vishnu is, considers himself a servant of the goddess. And this is nowhere more uh, truly illustrated than in his yoga maya, sorry, uh, yoga nidra pastime of so-called sleep. Huh? He's in yoga nidra. He's dead to the world. <laughs> He's uh, gone. Well, where is he? Brahma one time had, was having trouble with some demons and he approached uh, Vishnu. But Vishnu was asleep. And Brahma is scratching his head, well, one of his heads anyway, <laughs> and saying, what is this? Vishnu is the Lord of all. He's all pervading in the universe. He knows everything, omniscient, omnipotent. Why is he asleep? And Brahma came to the conclusion, this is narrated in the Devi Bhagavatam. Brahma came to the conclusion that some Shakti had entered him and was causing his sleep pastime. So in other words, he was in yoga maya. He was in yoga. Vishnu was in yoga with Shakti in the form of a nidra, sleep, nidra Shakti. And soon after Brahma prayed to this Shakti, please come out. Uh, and she came out and Vishnu woke up. So he should have thought of that when Vishnu is sleeping with his head on his bow. <laughs> we narrated that episode some time ago. But anyway, Brahma is a jiva, so he makes a lot of mistakes. Then there's parenthood. For example, well, another example from Krishna Leela, when he becomes uh, when he is born from Yashoda and Devaki in the prison house of Kansa, first he appears in his forearm form as God. But then the uh, devotees, Nanda and Yashoda, I mean, sorry, uh, Vasudev and Devaki, pray to him, please assume your human form because we want to relate to you as our human child. See, this is Vatsalya Rasa, parenthood. And then again, when he goes to Vrindavan, uh, same thing happens. <laughs> Nanda and Yashoda don't want him as God. They want him as their son. They want to have parental feelings toward him. Uh, another example is when uh, Devi takes birth in the uh, family of the Himalayas, the Himavat. Uh, that's when she becomes uh, the wife of Shiva for the second time. So she also appears at first in her uh, four-armed or eight-armed form. And then her so-called father, Himavat, prays to her, please take the form of an ordinary human so that we can enjoy the parental rasa with you. Uh, and she becomes Parvati. Parvati then later on marries Shiva and so on like that. 
So these pastimes are going on. In this world, exceptionally, but mainly in the spiritual world, in the Sri Chakra, there are three transcendental cities on the top of Mount Meru. And they are the Vishnu Loka, Brahma Loka, and the highest of all is the Sri Chakra, the, the city of Devi. Uh, and this is the only one that's not destroyed in the Mahapralaya at the end of the universe. Everything else, even Vishnu's, Vishnu Loka or uh, Vaikuntha, or whatever you want to call it, is also destroyed. Vishnu himself is immortal. And he takes birth as her son in the next creation. And there's a wonderful story in the Srimad Bhagavatam of Markandeya, Markandeya Rishi, who desires to see this pastime of Pralaya, Mahapralaya. So the rains and floods come, and then the great fire at the end of the universe burns everything up. And then again, the ocean comes, the causal ocean. And floating in the causal ocean on a banyan leaf is baby Vishnu. <laughs> and then uh, Devi reveals in the Devi Bhagavatam that she, uh, take, he takes birth as her son in every creation. And she mothers him and nurses him and brings him up. And then he becomes the uh, maintainer of the universe. And he inherits many of her qualities like omnipresence, omniscience, and so on. So you see, these are the higher forms of liberation. So the devotees that live eternally in the spiritual world with Devi, they have these different qualities. Salokya, they live in the same place with the god or goddess that they worship. Samipya, they're in close relationship, definitely per, uh, permanently personal relationship with the Godhead. Sarupya, they have a similar form, very beautiful, indestructible. They have so much knowledge and wisdom. Huh? And that means um, that they also have the same opulences, sarshti. Opulence means beauty, wealth, fame, power, knowledge, and renunciation. See, they're all great yogis. They're all completely Brahman realized. They have no mundane egos, but they exist to have pastimes and also to serve the Godhead in different ways. I mean, put yourself in God's position. Huh? You've got not only one universe, like the one we live in, You've got many, many like uncountable universes and you need many, many people, assistants, to help run them and regulate them, and create them and so on. So what do you do with all these beings that you create? Huh? Do they all have to attain Sayuja Mukti and just disappear? I mean, that seems like an awful waste of effort, doesn't it? after bringing up so many uncountable millions and billions of living entities and giving them so many experiences so that they understand how the creation works, wouldn't it be a shame to just throw them all away? That doesn't make any sense. But rather, those who are properly formed, in other words, they're sane, they're devotees of, of the, the Godhead, the Brahman, the Absolute, whatever you want to call it. Keep them around and use their experience to make them valuable servants and helpers in the business of administering the universe. See, so this is the actual purpose of the creation is to <laughs> bring up these souls, these beings, and uh, uh, make them mature. Mature means they have an eternal yoga relationship with the Absolute. This is yoga maya, and this is the real secret of liberation. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.